Good morning, everyone, both those who are here in the hall, as well as those online. <clears throat> it's a uh, lovely opportunity to come together and spend the day uh, practicing Dhamma, reflecting on Dhamma, and uh, the theme uh, for today um, is uh, around Ajahn Cha, um, and uh, one of the things that I thought I would do uh, was just give different perspectives uh, on uh, on Ajahn Cha's teachings and some of the important things, well, things that I thought were important anyway. And, uh, but we'll uh, get to that. Maybe we'll begin by sitting quietly, um, start the day, settling the mind. And uh, uh, so people want to, uh, I mean, everybody's seated already. So just to uh, uh, make yourself comfortable And picking up on that theme of, of Ajahn Chah, <clears throat> I mean, there is no such thing as the Ajahn Chah method of meditation. Um, so that uh, Ajahn Chah was, was, was quite adept at uh, uh, trying to adapt the teachings and, and the methods of practice for uh, individuals. And he certainly encouraged everybody to uh, experiment for themselves and try to figure out what, what actually works, uh, what works for you, what works for us, um, as opposed to following some m mandated process. Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, He was asked uh, uh, one time if if he gave regular interviews uh, for his students, his meditation students or his monastics, and, and he said, "No, I'm just, uh, I just try to encourage people to learn how to interview themselves." And so it's. No, it's it's because that I think that's it's really important to to because uh, uh, oftentimes we're yeah we're waiting for the either the advice of of a respected teacher or the uh, uh, kind of the guidance of of somebody else, and we tend to overlook our own inner resources. And, and that's, uh, that's something that uh, Ajahn Chah really encouraged. And certainly the life in the monastery of uh, Ajahn Chah's monastery, you, you were encouraged to be reflecting, investigating, practicing, uh, along with um, participating in the daily routine. And the, I mean, just the, the regular... Morning and evening chanting, the alms around the meal, uh, chores uh, that were done on a daily basis, looking after the monastery. Uh, because um, even if you live in a monastery, things don't get done for you. You have to look after themselves. And, and just learning how to live together as a community. And so that's something that is sometimes missed in, in especially for from the lay perspective uh, that somehow monasteries are 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 uh, um, kind of re rarefied retreat centers where the monks are just meditating all the time uh, i can assure you that's not how it works <laughs> uh, no, there's just a, a lot of practical practical reality of uh, looking after a place and, and that was a, something that Ajahn Chai used to encourage his uh, senior um, 
monastics is, you know, be very careful what you build uh, because you've got to look after it. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, uh, so when you're, you're looking after it, you tend to focus on simplicity. Oh, just a sec. We'll need one more, one more mat. The, the news was, uh, yeah, great. <clears throat> Thank you. So again, in that theme of, of how using the meditation throughout our day. I mean, part of, you know, a big part of our day is also sitting quietly and, and uh, uh, meditating. Um, but also Ajahn Chah um, would encourage a lot of reflection or investigation so that to um, besides trying to settle the mind and um, bringing the mind to a place of stillness, uh, he would encourage a lot of investigation, so really paying attention to to the the experience of of our mind and and see it through the light of of anicca dukkhanata of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, not self. Um, and to be uh, paying attention to the way that the the, the, the mind reacts, uh, it's because that's what the mind does is is it reacts to things. Uh, so that what are what are our reactions? Are they skillful? Are they unskillful? Are they useful? Are they not useful? Uh, do they lead to peace or do they lead to confusion? So that's uh, so rather than waiting for some magical moment when everything becomes clear and you're you're forever peaceful after you know, it's you've got to be willing to investigate and pay attention to the content of one's one's experience, but also. This is knowing how to not get caught up in, the, uh, say, in the world. And when the, when we say the world, uh, it's also uh, the world is our our mind, how we experience it, the avenue whereby we do uh, experience the world. It's like Ajahn Chah, say, you know, one who gets lost in the world gets lost in their moods. One who gets lost in their moods gets lost in the world. Uh, that's the, the the nature of our experience. So just developing a a, a foundation of, of clarity in the mind, so that we can see see more clearly. One of the most common meditation. Uh, practices and techniques that, that were used by Ajahn Chah was, of course, as is most common in all Buddhist countries, the mindfulness of breathing. Um, and uh, so that... Uh, paying attention to one's posture, sitting with an upright... Um, Body, not 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 slumping. Um, bring your kind of energy without getting too tense, too tight. And uh, there's this nice balance that is is uh, is really helpful uh, for meditation. Where it's um, yeah, you're sitting upright. The breathing is nice and smooth because you are upright. You're not. Leaning to the right, leaning to the left, leaning forward, leaning backwards, but you're 
um, sitting nice and upright, um, but not trying too hard. We're not sort of in a ramrod soldier's attention. It's it's a, it's a different uprightness. It's a, a comfortable one. Paying attention to the sensation of the breath as it comes in, the sensation at the tip of the nose as it passes the chest, as the abdomen rises, then as the abdomen falls, sensation of that falling, sensation at the chest, sensation at the tip of the nose, that rhythm of the breath. And after one has paid it, and, and one could do that the whole period if one wants, yeah, but, but also the, there tends to be a time when it starts to feel comfortable and settled and one can focus on one particular point, <clears throat> whether it's at the abdomen or the chest area or the tip of the nose, uh, it's whatever feels comfortable, uh, just so that bringing the attention <clears throat> uh, and awareness of of that breathing process uh, to uh, 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 to one point. When we talk about one pointing. <clears throat> the mind, uh, it's, it's I, I've always found it helpful to not try to force the mind onto a point. Uh, and it's, there is a, because there is that, um, well, the, the word we use you know, commonly in the English language in meditation circles is concentration, concentrate the mind. Uh, samadhi is often translated as right concentration, or right samadhi, right samma samadhi, right concentration, which is okay, uh, sort of, uh, but... Uh, um, just literally, the word concentrate means to make small. You know, so to making your mind too small is really uncomfortable sometimes. You're trying to concentrate and, and you're making the mind small. So it's just this point, one point uh, is not a point that is trying to push away or exclude anything. But having a point that includes, is spacious, uh, is there's a certain open clarity to awareness. And I uh, find that quite helpful as, a, as an image of, you know, say, a point that includes. It, isn't, it doesn't have to exclude anything, it doesn't push anything away. Whatever arises has a place. We can know it, but we can also let it go. You don't have to annihilate it. And just uh, just let it let it go, uh, and rather than chasing after it or being uh, too concerned about it. Uh, so that 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 sense of coming to the using the rhythm of the breath, the sensation of the breath as a vehicle to allow a, a, a clarity and, yeah, and spaciousness to establish itself. The method or a, a method that Ajahn Chah used to use and is widely taught in the northeast of Thailand is also using uh, like a meditation word in conjunction with the breath which in Thai uh, works quite neatly um, 
because they pronounce the word Buddha in a slightly different way, Buddha. And so on the in breath, Buddha, and out breath, To. So just, um, I'm going to adjust that to Buddha. And it's just trying to use a, these two simple syllables to direct attention to just staying with the object of of attention um, using the name of the Buddha uh, is helpful in the sense that the Buddha is a a refuge for us so, uh, one of the the jewels, uh, triple gem, and Buddha Dhamma and Sangha, uh, but also on the meaning of the word Buddha. Uh, it's a great reminder of what we're trying to do in the sense of uh, just oh, Buddha is this, this sense of knowing, of awareness. Uh, this quality, this knowing awareness. Also, it has the literal meaning of being awake. Um, it's the awakening to truth, awakening to the way things truly are. And also the, uh, the quality of a kind of brightness and radiance. Uh, these are the... Um, Kind of a constellation of meanings of the of the word Buddha, the one who knows, the awakened one, the radiant one. But these are not qualities of somebody else. I mean, they are, but they're also qualities which we can direct our attention to and allow to arise within our own hearts or to tap into. Uh, those qualities within ourselves. So just being with the knowing, we, it's intrinsic to our nature. This quality of awakening and being awake, alert, present, is intrinsic to our nature. And we forget about it or we miss it, miss the point. Quality of radiance and kind of happiness. When we don't get in the way, it's it's amazing how bright the mind really can be. Uh, just learning how to step back and allow this quality of knowing to be present. And we can do that each in-breath, each out-breath. Uh, so it's renewing one's acquaintance with the knowing. And of course, you know, we we drift off or we forget or whatever. Um, but we just return attention to the knowing, and it is right there. <clears throat> and we don't have to chase after it. We don't have to run after it. Uh, it, it is there if we don't if we don't forget it. Uh, so that's something that, uh, you know, in terms of a a way of teaching, a way of that the uh, that Ajahn Chah used to introduce the meditation and and, uh, and with that settling um, and then being willing to turn the attention to reflection and investigation um, sometimes the <clears throat> the settling and calming of the mind helps the the mind to become more clear in its investigation. Sometimes the investigation helps the mind be more clear and calm and allows one to say, to drop the, 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 the that investigation and return to clarity. There's no sort of absolute right uh, in this. It's what what is it that helps the mind the heart, and be, be clear, be steady. Uh -huh. 
and both those aspects are are needed and it's something that Ajahn Chah um, you know, because that, that, I mean, it's an age-old question, you know, you know, do you need to develop, you know, how much samadhi do you need before you do vipassana, how much vipassana is, and it goes on and on, it's like, you know, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, I mean, it's, it's, it's an endless cycle that, that, that there is no definitive answer, it's, uh, but what, what actually works for you? What helps the mind become more steady and clear? What helps the heart become more free from from suffering, from dis ease, discontent? So that uh, this is an important foundation to be laying for oneself. Anyway. And this is a, I was going to give a brief introduction of Ajahn Chah's approach to meditation practice and and then say it, but uh, I'll talk longer, let's sit.
Okay, so we could just transition to have a bit of walking meditation. Um, <clears throat> I'll, uh, for about half an hour, it's 9.45 now, we could, uh, uh, if somebody could ring a bell at 10.15, uh, we can come back into the hall. Uh, I'll give a, 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 a teaching, Dhamma teaching then, but it... Uh, but it'd be nice to begin the morning with some sitting meditation, walking meditation. Um, uh, people, uh, in terms of walking meditation, those who aren't familiar with walking meditation and just normally just going and finding a, a spot, whether it's, uh, there's a lot of people here today, so outside would probably be, uh, most people are going to need to be outside. It's finding a flat spot where you can walk back and forth, usually about 15, 20, 25 paces. Um, that uh, just slowly walking back and forth doesn't have to be super slow. Uh, uh, just be, again, just finding a, a level of comfort and ease. Uh, and... Uh, just changing posture and you're using the same attention that you would in paying attention to the breath, but paying attention to the sensation of the, your your movement of lifting a foot, setting it down, lifting a foot, setting it down. Uh, as a, a paying attention to the body, rooting, grounding attention uh, in a bodily presence. And uh, and uh, if reflections come up in the mind, then to pay attention to that. And, and again, not getting because sometimes there is a blur between reflections and proliferations, and so that uh, you want to be pursuing those things that refl uh, investigating experience. Uh, but you don't want to be just proliferating on everything that flits through your mind. Uh, one of Ajahn Chah's uh, admonitions, you know, you know, be very careful. The mind is a liar and a cheat. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to trust it too far. <laughs> so so, so you, we can tangle ourselves up in our minds. Just, what is it that creates more spence, space and more clarity? So uh, if uh, people want to transition, anybody wants to continue sitting, they're more than welcome to. So try to uh, preserve the, the kind of the, the calm and quiet of the space if there are people who want to. Uh, continue sitting, and then we'll come back at uh, ten fifteen.
again, welcome everyone. Um, <clears throat> today's uh, teaching was uh, titled or billed as Perspectives on Buddhist Practice from Ajahn Chah and uh, so what it, uh, um, what I thought uh, to uh, to do was to try to focus on a few areas of of Ajahn Chah's uh, teaching that uh, I think were uh, he saw as important, uh, and, and and I think are. You know, say very helpful for uh, us in the West, and and to a certain degree, um, there uh, uh, tend to be things that are uh, maybe not so much emphasized in in uh, uh, the uh, um, teachings. What that that, that tend to be. Uh, around or or, or popular um, in the uh, uh, in, in say modern uh, Buddhist circles, and that's both in the West as well as in Thailand. I mean, there's some you know, things that the uh, the forest teachers teach that that uh, even though it's a Buddhist culture. I think you know. Well, this is Buddhism one hundred and one. Why didn't they didn't did they not get the program? And they threw well, well, no. I mean, it's it's human nature. Um, it's the uh, you know so that the the emphasis that that Ajahn Chah placed on say on sila um, uh, the, the uh, uh, virtue. Uh, uh, integrity, morality, precepts, um, uh, I think fundamental human goodness. I mean, a sila is, is uh, uh, Ajahn Chah didn't approach it as a, uh, uh, a uh, 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 you know, just a, a bunch of rules to follow. And, and he was, was quite, uh, uh, but he saw it as as uh, integral to the inter- to the whole path uh, of if we're if we're talking about the g- growth and maturity of of a human being and human consciousness, and there needs to be a fundamental foundation in 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 sila. And I think it's helpful to sometimes it's helpful to get the. Uh, um, uh, the Buddha's jargon, you know, the the, uh, the 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 words that the Buddha himself used, because uh, sometimes when we when it's translated, then what gets conjured up is 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 the uh, kind of a lot of the cultural conditioning that we have from our own language, uh, so that for uh, yeah, for uh, many of us, and uh, when say if sila is translated as morality then we we uh, uh, you know i don't know about anybody else but me i get my back up pretty quick uh, and uh, and it's not that uh, the buddha or ajahn chah were not moral beings they're incredibly <laughs> incredible moral beings um but it was uh a yeah, this virtue and integrity and just deep well of goodness arising out of a purity of heart. Um, and uh, and it's also uh, understandable sometimes where it gets, it gets, it doesn't get that much airplay or it gets skipped over. Uh, uh, so the, but, uh, it is, uh, and, and Ajahn Chah, I mean, he came to North America only one time in his, in his life, and, and, uh, and it was his second trip to the West. 
Uh, but uh, it was one of the things that he noticed. Is not a whole lot of of emphasis on on that that fundamental sila as a as a foundation, and uh, and he uh, ended up talking quite a bit about it in in, in during his 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 time uh, in the you know, second trip to the to the west. Um, Yes, it's it's to a certain degree. It was sort of well, you know, people are more interested in in meditation and teachings on liberation, which is true. Um, but Ajahn, as Ajahn Chah said, well, yeah, but if you you know, teaching Buddhism without sila is like sending someone out in the open sea in a leaky boat, and it's just. It's just not a, it's not a good good start, and so that that. Uh, but yeah, in Lumpur, uh, and and I I did, uh, I went, uh, and I'm actually prepared for this, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it's not always what I do. <laughs> um, so, but but I know it's delightful to 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 be reminded of uh, Vajan Chah's teachings in many ways, and and uh, but yeah, in Lumpur Chah's vision of sila, it's the basis of how to live live together in the world comfortably and harmoniously. An image he used uh, was this: uh, in Thailand, the millipedes are really big; they have a lot of legs. You'd think that with that many legs, they would trip over each other. Uh, and it would be really, and it would really be difficult. But they don't. Those legs all work together. They move along pretty smoothly. And so that, in the same way, it's possible to live together harmoniously as a community, as a society, as a culture. Uh, and and of course, the, the sila is what provides that foundation for living together uh, in a uh, in a, a, a harmonious and smooth manner. Uh, on a social level, then stepping back from the tendency to selfishness, a sense of harmony is facilitated. So Sila is not just a bunch of rules to be followed, but guidelines for how human beings can live together, not creating harm for each other and for fostering a sense of trust and well-being. And so that, that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, that sense of... of uh, uh, sila, uh, being, uh, yeah, yes, there are these uh, different um, precepts that the Buddha gives, um, but the uh, but they're what, what they are, um, uh, and I think it's quite different from yeah from our our Judeo Christian background. Uh, these are our training rules, and they are foundations for training ourselves in body, speech, and mind. Uh, and it's quite, uh, how do you say, uh, explicit in the the actual formula for taking the precepts uh, in the, in the scriptural language. Uh, it's like the first precept, Bhagavati Bhata, where that many sikapadang samadhyami is sort of, sort of the I undertake the training rule uh, to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. So it's it's a, a sort of one that's it's done voluntarily, and and two, you're making a determination to train. And and uh, the, the what is usually translated as precept is called is is sika pada, and pada is literally means foot, and sika means to learn or to study or to educate oneself or to train and of course education is training uh, and uh, so that that uh, you know the, this this emphasis that Ajahn Chah made on sila and there, there, there's a, uh, you know, through the day I'll try to cover uh, a, a variety of topics that that I think uh, yeah, again, Ajahn Chah emphasized and and uh, kind of typified his his approach to 
uh, to to teaching, and so so that aspect of virtue. Another aspect of relinquishment, uh, relinquishment, um, renunciation. Uh, the uh, yeah, I mean, just in the English language, you say renunciation. You, oh my God, I've got to give up something. And, but because renunciation is something I'm missing out on something, whereas uh, yeah, relinquishment is a bit is a bit nicer in the sense I'm actually giving up something, relinquishing something that's been a burden to my heart, uh, and uh, and you realize, oh, this is, uh, and 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 and, and Ajahn Chai in so many ways continually pointed to this aspect of relinquishment, letting go, uh, putting putting things down. Uh, whatever we pick up is heavy. And be willing to put it down. Uh, he says, and you say, and say, even something, that you know, we pick up our phones, uh, we pick up a lot. <laughs> you know, <laughs> You think, well, it's not so much, not so heavy, yeah. but uh, you know, there's a lot there, and there's a lot to everything. Uh, so I've been carrying, just having to carry it around with us all the time. Uh, but uh, you know, along with the, that, there's all, all the extra baggage that comes with whatever we pick up. Uh, so that that sense of uh, relinquishment is being able to to to, to let go, to put down. Another aspect of Ajahn Chah's teaching that he would emphasize is the aspect of this awareness. This, as I mentioned in the, the meditation instruction, this sense of the being, the knowing. That this is a fundamental quality of mind, a fundamental nature of mind uh, that we can be plugging into and it has the power to free the heart. And so this, this fundamental uh, awareness, um, knowing quality of alertness and presence. Uh, and then the, the aspects of liberation. Um, Ajahn Chah didn't, uh, I mean, he didn't talk about it all the time, but he didn't shy away from talking about that the whole point of the Buddhist teachings, whether it's for lay people or for monastics, whether it's for men or for women, for young or for old, for the educated, the uneducated, this was about liberation. The possibility of the Buddhist teachings is about freedom from freedom from suffering. It's not it's not that far away. And the Buddha himself said the same thing. He said, you know, if I thought you couldn't, you couldn't do this or it can't be done, I wouldn't teach it. But because this can be done, uh, therefore I teach this, I give this teaching. And he spent, I mean, his, uh, his first inclination when he was first awakened was, I don't know that anybody's going to understand this. I don't, maybe I won't bother teaching. Uh, but then, you know, the the, you know, the heart of compassion arose, and and said, okay, there are beings with little dust in their eyes. And he, and he committed to forty five years of teaching to uh, establish this dispensation that, that is, is given teachings of liberation for you know twenty six hundred years. So it's uh, you know we're we're still benefiting from it so so long ago and in you know, tremendous distance. And so it's uh, um, something to uh, uh, over the day I'll I'll give uh, this morning I'll touch on a couple things and uh, a few things and then uh, uh, see where we go and, and this afternoon I'll give another a reflection. Oh, also, before I forget, I was asked to, to uh, mention to everybody that, uh, say, at the back are the 
um, there's uh, sheets of paper, and, and if, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to write them. I guess put them in the basket, uh, and they will be collected about 12.15, uh, collated and, and, uh, and, and typed up, and so that the Q&A session uh, will, will begin at, at, at 1 o'clock-ish, whenever we're together after after the after the meal time uh, I try to have the q and a sessions at at one o'clock it's mainly because that's one of the few times when hopefully people don't fall asleep so we start the afternoon with a meditation i don't don't guarantee it. <laughs> But there's, hopefully, it, it gets generates enough interest. And so, so if anybody has questions, uh, feel free to to uh, write them out. So this aspect of um, virtue um, again, sila. Um, the uh, there's an exchange that that Ajahn Chah had when he was a young monk. He was worried about Sila, about precepts, about his training rules, and uh, he said that. And this is him talking. Uh, it so happened that I had a chance to go and see Venerable Ajahn Man, so I asked him. Venerable Ajahn, what am I to do? I've just begun to practice, but I still don't know the right way. I have so many doubts. I can't find any foundation at all in the practice. He asked, what's the problem? In the course of my practice, I picked up the Visuddhimagga, which is a very famous uh, manual on, on, on practice and, and, uh, and the teachings, uh, and read it. But it seems impossible to put into practice. Uh, the contents of the aspects around sila, uh, sila nidesa, samadhi nidesa, banya nidesa, the, the, the sections on sila, on virtue, sections on samadhi, or meditation, sections on banya, wisdom, insight, seem to be completely impractical. I don't think there's anybody in the world who could do it. It's so detailed and medic- meticulous. To memorize every single rule would be impossible. It's beyond me. He said to me, Venerable, there's a lot, it's true, but it's really only a little. If we were to, take, if we were to take account of every training rule in the Sila Nidesa, that would be difficult, that is true. But actually, what we call the Sila Nidesa, the section on, the, on Sila and virtue, has evolved from the human mind. If we train the mind to have a sense of uh, a sense of shame and fear of wrongdoing, these are translations for, and it's a very difficult term to translate, hiri and otapa, and uh, uh, because the hiri is a is a sense of shrinking back um, out of a sense of this isn't appropriate for me. Um, this is not not as this is not this is not my best side, um, and and then a fear of wrongdoing is a is a is a fear of the consequences of one's action. So it's it's a foundation, but these are again what the Buddha called these, uh, and. One is a, uh, I'm trying to remember how Ajahn Jeff translates as conscience. Uh, anybody else remember? Yeah, conscience and concern. Yeah, that's that's a uh, that's a. It's trying to get away from the, the, the again the, that that uh, mm, yeah old mm, Judeo-Christian language. Conscience and concern. 
So it says, and the Buddha calls these qualities the protectors of the world, Lokapala. Uh, these are protectors of the world, and they're and and the reason why there is this sense of conscience of hearing is because one respects oneself. One has a respect, fundamental respect for oneself, so one doesn't want to stain the heart. Uh, and the reason why one has yeah, a fear of wrongdoing or a concern is that one has a respect for others. Uh, so it's a, these are extremely beautiful qualities, uh, that uh, bright qualities of the heart that protect the world. Um, so that uh, if we train this mind to have a sense of hiri and a sense of otapa, uh, we will then be restrained, we will be cautious. This will condition us to be content with little, with few wishes, because we can't possibly look after a lot. When this happens, our mindfulness becomes stronger. We will be able to maintain mindfulness at all times. Wherever we are, we will make the effort to maintain Maintain thorough mindfulness. Caution will be developed. Whatever you doubt, don't say it. Don't act on it. If there's anything you don't understand, ask the teacher. Trying to practice every single training rule would indeed be burdensome, but we should examine whether we are prepared to admit our faults or not. Do we accept them? This teaching is very important. It's not so much that we must know every single training rule, if we know how to train our own minds. So this is a, again, Ajahn Chah's approach to, to Sila um, is to more turning to the inner qualities that, that uh, need to be cultivated in order for a natural virtue and integrity to arise rather than, you know, in the same way that I talked about meditation, I'm trying to force the mind into a, a place of stillness uh, and a place of concentration. Uh, in the same way with, with, with Sila, one is reflecting on, on the, 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 inter, the, what's the nature of one's own mind? What's the nature of one's intention? And that's, that's something that I, uh, of course, living with Ajahn Chah, I'd hear over and over and over again. You're keeping these, the, this container of the precepts in order to, to be a mirror for the mind and understand your own, the volition of the mind, the intention behind one's actions to speak or to act or to think or to conceive of anything. What's the fundamental impulse behind it. So that's, that so precepts are, are, are virtue and sila is then a integrated part of the whole training of this, this body, speech, and mind. And um, particularly the mind, because if it, it uh, um, again, the mind is a liar and a cheat. So, and we can justify just about anything. We've all got our own inner lawyer that uh, is able to make a case for, for its preferences and its attachments. And so that having, uh, okay, having a sila as a, as a basis. So Ajahn Chah would place tremendous emphasis <clears throat> on, on that. Another aspect that, uh, that uh, you know, or another kind of topic that I wanted to, to cover um, uh, was the uh, aspect of relinquishment and just that sense of, of uh, um, yeah, of, Letting go, and of course, there's, there's a well-known teaching that um, I was actually first uh, presented in, in a collection of of uh, the first book that that Jack uh, uh, did, um, Still Forest Pool, uh, along with Paul Brighter, 
And and so it's it, it's just this well known teaching. If you let go a little, you'll get a little peace. If you let go a lot, you get a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you get complete peace. And just this is the this path of practice, path of training, path of of inclining the heart to that which is peaceful is uh, not in trying to get it or make it or achieve it, attain it. It's, 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 it's realized through letting go, through relinquishment. And so that, 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 that's, that's such a, uh, an important thing to get one's mind around. I say, well, especially when we experience some difficulty or some obstacle, you know, oftentimes we try to be really clever. Of, you know, what do I need to do? How do I get to? And it's, it's, I think it's really helpful. Oh, what can I let go of here? What can? What am I hanging on to? Uh, and uh, you know, and the closer you look, the, the more you realize, wow, okay, I'm hanging on to a lot here. <laughs> um. <clears throat> also, uh, um, a, a uh, this aspect of relinquishment. Uh, again, Jack talks about it in in when he very first went to meet Ajahn Chah, and uh, and Jack had been because um, he'd been a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand, and he had lived in the northeast of Thailand. So, as they get in Peace Corps, you get very, very good language training. Uh, and then he was living in in the northeast of Thailand, so he managed to get a very good foundation in the in the northeastern dialect, which was uh, what Ajahn Chah uh, was. That was his primary language, and it wasn't until much later in his life that he be, really started. Like when Jack first went, when Ajahn Sumedha was already there, um, you wouldn't hear Thai spoken. It would be it'd be the northeastern Laotian dialect, <clears throat> and uh, which is a uh, it's a fun language, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's really kind of down home, down home Lao. Uh, it's, 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 it's fun, very direct. But anyway, he could, he could, when Jack went, he could speak, communicate with Ajahn Chah, which was, say, different than when I went, because he you know, kind of wander off the hippie trail and, and uh, show up and, and, and at Ajahn Chah's monastery, as a newly ordained monk, but with no, no background in language and not even any background in real training, uh, so uh, uh, having to go through whoever was around who could translate at those day, in those days, uh, but Jack was had the good fortune to be able to communicate directly with him. So then, when he when he arrived at uh, Lopa Cha, his first greeting uh, was, well, I hope you're not afraid to suffer. <laughs> and, and, of course, Jack was, uh, took him uh, aback really quickly and uh, asked, uh, Jack asked him what he meant, and Paul explained that there are two kinds of suffering. One that you turn away from, and it keeps following you, and the second, uh, which is the suffering you're willing to face and learn from. Uh, the second kind is what gives us the ability to be free. Uh, Lumpa Cha was never afraid to make us confront this, and hence sometimes training with Lumpa could could be difficult. Um, and that that, uh, uh, but it, it how you say it pushed you into relinquishment. It pushed you into letting go, and so it was. Um, but I think we all had a confidence in in Ajahn Chah that uh, um, okay, just yeah, this is difficult. He's pushing me to my limits of what I'm willing to let go of. But 
there's something there. It's like when I, I guess it was last year. Um, yeah, it was last year. Um, my, uh, I was talking with my my mom. My mom's still alive. She's a hundred and one, uh, and <laughs> and uh, she said, "I'm." Cleaning up my stuff. I'm cleaning out my my, my stuff, and and uh, I've got a. I'm getting rid of everything. I said I've got a, a a box of all the letters you ever wrote when you were away, which I had no idea she kept any of that. Uh, and it was yeah, it was all everything, basically all the letters and aerograms and whatnot that I sent. Uh, from the time I was just as a traveler, and 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 then uh, and then went to Thailand, and then ordained, and then uh, stayed until I came to America here in 1997. So like from '73 through '97, so she had all these these letters, and in one of them, I think it was in my third year as a monk. And and I was explaining to my parents and my family that uh, I said I haven't told you about, about this. And actually, this is the only letter that I have reread. I, mean, I can't bear to look at them. Other people have read them, but uh, <laughs> I, I can't quite bring myself to to reading it. But uh, for some reason, this. Drew me. I think because I also had there was one that I'd sent a whole bunch of slides uh, from from that year. I think it was from 1975, and yeah, I think it was 1975 slides uh, that I'd sent to my family for them to see, and they'd just been packed away all these years, so they were in perfect condition and uh, able to reprint them and make them available to. Uh, the people who were in those pictures, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I uh, I was um, saying to them, I, I don't think I've told you all yet about uh, Ajahn Chah's five year plan. <laughs> and said that it's that uh, um, Ajahn Chah expects. Everyone to to if, if you're going to train with him to stay at least five years with him so that uh, um, I'm I'm going to be you're not going to be seeing me at least still for another five years uh, and that that uh, um, but then I explained that you know there's just something compelling uh, about Ajahn Chah's presence and and something I've never seen in anybody in my life that that he he is able to be kind of peaceful and calm and clear and and in a word I did use that's always resonated with me unshakable in the midst of everything it's is and I said you know it's a big monastery with lots of things lots of people there lots of um, a big community and lots of things happening around, but he is always unshakable. And if I can stay longer here and gain some of that unshakability, that would be, that's what I w- want to be doing. So uh, that, 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 and, 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 uh, and again, it, you know, so much of it is, yeah, what are we willing to let go of? What are we willing to relinquish? Um, because so much of our, you know, what we're shaken by uh, is is not so much uh, any particular impact of anything. It's how we feel about it, how we, what we take exception to, what we get caught, what we get worried about, what we get fearful of, what we get upset about. Uh, and can we be unshakable? Uh, and, and of course we can be, otherwise these teachings wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but it's it's through this 
doorway of of uh, of re- relinquishment of letting go uh, that is is the, uh, uh, the, the 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 primary way of 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 uh, realizing that So there's Ajahn Chah in one of his teachings, and it's from a uh, uh, a teaching that was it was titled "Unshakable Peace." Uh, that the way of the forest masters is the way of renunciation or relinquishment, uh, letting go. On the path, there's only abandoning. We uproot views stemming from self-importance. We uproot the very essence of our sense of self. I assure you, this practice will challenge you to the core. But no matter how difficult it is, don't discard the forest masters and their teachings. Without proper guidance, the mind and samadhi are potentially very deluding. Things which shouldn't be possible begin to happen. I've always approached such phenomena with caution and care. When I was a young monk, just starting out in practice during my first few years, I couldn't yet trust my mind. However, once I'd gained considerable experience and could fully trust the workings of my mind, nothing could pose a problem. Even if unusual phenomena manifested, I'd just leave it at that. If we are clued in to how these things work, they cease by themselves. It's all fuel for wisdom. As time goes on, we find ourselves completely at ease. And so that, that, that ease is, 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 is access through you know, what, we're, what we're willing to let go of, what we're ready to to relinquish and, and abandon. So that that uh, again that that, that uh, it's it's such a uh, an important flavor uh, of the uh, uh, of the teachings of of, of Ajahn Chah, and uh, and he uh, and he exemplified it in his in his own in his own life. I mean, he never really. Um, uh, I mean, he never, he never held back, um, in the sense of, oh, you know, I, uh, if somebody was interested in, uh, in receiving teachings, um, I mean, he was, he was, he, he was always, he was, he was ready to just set aside his own, uh, his own preference or his own uh, feelings and 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 always he was always there for for people he was ready to uh, to to give the, the, that uh, uh, that quality of uh, and to say relinquishment is is not quite doesn't really get the flavor of it because it's still when you say oh, like I am relinquishing Something. But when there's no self to get in the way, uh, there's just this this, this uh, complete, complete and utter uh, letting go, and and, uh, and and that's where where ease uh, ease comes from. Uh, it's like I'm thinking uh, of a uh, uh, there was a monk who came to stay with Ajahn Chah, and he had. Uh, practiced at different places, and he'd been on his own uh, for uh, for for a fair time, and and done a lot of solitude practice, and uh, and then he was staying with Ajahn Chah, and uh, and, and he uh, he just found it irritating and frustrating uh, to just. The, the duties or the what was required and 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 also he was uh, uh, 
uh, he, he recounts as he said because he, he he wanted to draw close to Ajahn Chah, so he asked to be a uh, to take a turn in being his attendant. Uh, but then, being with Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Chah would receive people and and talk to the villagers or the townspeople or, or visiting monastics. Uh, and and uh, and he said, and this, and this monk said, you know, sometimes it's just it just sounded so mundane, and I just want to, and I'd start to uh, get tired and so I go tired of it and I go to my breath immediately and just try to you know, not have to not have to deal with that and he said as soon as I did that he said, it's like it was uncanny because I Jen Cha seemed to know my mind he said he was, he was and I said oh Tan you know Go and get me this. Oh, go and clean this spittoon for you. Oh, do <laughs> he's always finding something for him. To, he couldn't ever settle uh, in the way that he liked. And so then, uh, uh, and then finally he got fed up and and uh, and uh, went to pay respects to Ajahn Chah and asked permission to leave. He wanted to take leave and go somewhere else. And Ajahn Chah said, "Well, you yeah, you're welcome to to leave. You can." Go back and to your cave and learn how to be peaceful there, or you can stay on here and learn how to be peaceful anywhere. <laughs> he stayed, <laughs> much to his credit and to his his discernment. So that that, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that took. Relinquishment, and, and, uh, and we have to re- say that relinquishment on on so many different levels. But in the end, it really comes back to this sense of self, the sense of me, me and my preference, me and my agenda, me and my uh, uh, views and opinions. Uh, and that's something that Ajahn Chah was was asked. You know, what's the biggest obstacle for Practitioners, you know, whether they're monastic or lay people, and Ajahn Chah, yeah, views and opinions. <laughs> yeah, people, because they seem so right. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, give some space, and you see, yeah, so I can let that go as well. Okay, I think that's enough of a enough to reflect on. This morning, it's sort of moving toward the meal time. Um, maybe we can just sit quietly for a little bit and let those uh, teachings percolate a bit and see if anything resonates.
Okay, so we could <clears throat> transition to mealtime. Um, as monastics, we're, uh, say, allowed to eat between dawn and noon. So, uh, of course, this being daylight savings time, we've got a bit of, bit of extra time. Um, but uh, the, one of the aspects of it is that uh, you know, the food that we receive has to be offered. And, uh, and, so, and um, you know, in, say, like in Thailand, then in the morning, then the monastics go out into the local villages and, and uh, receive alms from the uh, from the from the villages and villagers, and uh, it was one of the things that Ajahn Chah was quite adamant when they very first went to the West, went to England. Uh, on Ajahn Chah's return, uh, he had Ajahn Sumedho and uh, monks, a couple, a few of the monks stay on to help establish some, see if it was a, a viable thing to do in London. Uh, and they had, they did have a, a, a center that was offered. Um, but Ajahn Chah said, make sure you go arms round every day. And that was, he said, and, and, uh, Ajahn Chah, or Ajahn Sumaya said, well, you know, we've tried it a few times and nobody offers us anything. <laughs> and, and Ajahn Chah says, you're not going for the food, you're going for the people. And, you know, it's sort of, and, and, and that's, it's, it's how the, say, the Sangha got to be known. Uh, and, uh, and then after a couple years in, London, they've moved out to the uh, countryside and established a forest monasteries. But the uh, uh, you know from only from time to time would they get actual food when they went along. So, but they did receive the forest that they established the first one. Chithurst Forest Monastery was was a result of alms round uh, a, a jogger on Hampstead Heath saw these monks all the time and then he finally screwed up his courage and talked to them and and uh, ended up he says you know, say, oh, I've got this forest that I, I can't I, I'm really looking for a steward to look after it and and Ajahn so says well we're a forest monks without the forest <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so it's uh so you never quite know what happens on Ramsar. But anyway, the many people have brought uh, offerings of food this morning, and uh, the monastics could go uh, and receive them. And then when when it's all received, the monastics can can put it into their alms bowls. We'll go and have our meal. Then we'll we'll uh, well before that we'll give the blessing, and then. Uh, We'll uh, uh, um, leave it. It's then after we're gone, then food's all yours. <laughs> Enjoy yourselves, and then you know, just have some time to have the meal, have a bit of a relaxing time. It's a beautiful day at Spirit Rock today, and then come back around about one o'clock ish. We'll see how see how things everything's cleaned up and neat and tidy when we come back here. Okay.